press record because I will forget. Um, so we're only going to do this for about an hour today. It's really just kind of a very brief rundown about the PWP training, what the role is like, what the training is like, the in application and interview process. Um, but before we get started, I'll let um, Vicky introduce herself and I'll introduce myself. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Victoria, call me Vicky. I am a senior psychological wellbeing practitioner in Thurrock. Um, I work, well, just a bit about myself and my role. So I've trained with inclusion um, in Thurrock. So I've done my PWP training. Before that, I used to work in a secondary care mental health unit. So I used to work with people who had who were detained, male, males who were detained under the Mental Health Act, but also had um, schizophrenia, uh, paranoia, delusions, and so on. Um, so it was quite intense. Um, but since then, I've done my training. I was a PWP for a couple of years and then I moved into the senior role. So ask me anything. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm Jason. I am currently a trainee CBT therapist. I'm in the Bromley service. That's where I trained as a PWP, where I became qualified, then a senior and now currently doing the training, um, CBT training at um, King's College London. Prior to getting on to the PWP train, I used to work with young people in a drugs and alcohol charity called Adaction, but they've changed their name now to We Are With You. Um, and yeah, so I've been PWP since 2018, did that for about a year, and then did the senior role um, where I specialised in um, drugs and alcohol, also did some guest lecturing at UCL for the PWP training course, and also ran the service user involvement programme as well so um i'm just wondering you know feel free to pop it in the chat or on mic yourself who here is applying this intake or who and who here is just thinking about it okay so we got um i am i am yeah Excellent. Great. So we've got quite quite a few people applying this year. And we've got someone applying for the next the intake after that as well. And um, just out of curiosity, where which universities are people thinking of applying to? Because um that's useful because I trained at UCL. Vicky, you trained at Athletics. Yeah. Got UCL. Sorry, and UCL. Manchester, East Anglia, Sheffield, Manchester, London, Surrey. I will say I have a bit of knowledge on the Surrey one as well, because I know a lot of people who trained at Surrey. Yeah. And um, for me, I mean, I know the kind of process, but I'm much more used to UCL. And the reason I say that is because UCL's um, process is a little different to other universities in that they you do it through their own um, application portal um, and also you are limited to a word count of about 500 for the application which is extremely limiting as well okay so you know I'm wondering here because I, the reason I ask is when I first applied for the PWP train I actually knew nothing about what PWP did what the role was and even what IAPT did so I'm wondering if it's worth just spending five minutes, you know, me and Vicky, just talk a little bit about actually what a day-to-day -day life looks like for a PWP and the purpose of IAP. So Vicky, since you're a PWP as a senior, you have the more up-to-date knowledge. So IAP is basically Improving Access to Psychological Therapies. That's what it stands for. And basically each service in England, all across um, all across England and different parts of, I believe there are a few in Scotland and, and Wales, um, we, uh, services are commissioned to treat a certain amount of people who present with common mental health difficulties. Um, so when we talk about common mental health difficulties, we start thinking about 
symptoms of depression, symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder, symptoms of panic, symptoms of agoraphobia with or without panic, um, symptoms of social anxiety and different comorbidities, long-term health conditions that impact it, and a wide range of, of, of difficulties that impact people's day-to-day -day life. So we are filling the gap of actually going out to the communities and getting people in and making them aware of, we are here to support you if you have day-to-day -day struggles. We aren't here to support people with situational difficulties, I would say. We are more here to support with people and empower them to feel in control of their day-to-day -day lives, feel that they are able to manage whatever comes their way. So it might be a situational thing going on, but actually we're focusing on the person themselves because you will learn um, if you do enter um, you know, this role or you will learn at university that we're here to treat people um, by giving them the tools and techniques to help themselves. So at PWP level, we're offering guided self-help. So IAPT was originally, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but originally um, found, well, decided and founded and created by an accountant. Is that right? Yeah, it sounds right. And, and yeah, I think, I think it officially it piloted in 2008. Yep. So as you can imagine, an accountant uh, created was someone in a similar job role creating um, a mental health therapy structure. It doesn't always go hand in hand. So a lot of it is about is a high pressure job. Um, any therapist will be under a lot of stress but we need to seek people as quickly as possible. So the quality of care has to be really high, but also it, it has to be fast paced. That's why most services will see clients for six sessions only. It depends on the service. I know my service doesn't cap the sessions, so we can see them for less or more time, um, as long as you have a rationale for it. But um, the reason I'm telling you this is to manage your expectations of going into this role of IAPT is really great at offering support for people, but it's also a really high pressure job. Yeah. And I think that's really important to note because um, by the time I did get onto the IAPT training, I did have an understanding of what to expect. But as a qualified as a senior seeing subsequent trainees get on I think the thing I noticed upon all of them was this kind of disappointment in what they were hoping for was kind of the, to deliver therapy a bit more long term you know to really go in a bit more depth with the client to kind of explore things like childhood history to really um get involved in it and I think one thing I often um see is that people have kind of like this kind of hero complex they want to do everything for the client they want to help them with every matter and unfortunately not just as a pwp but i act in mental health in general there are limits to what we can do it's about kind of doing what we can and kind of ending it there and so that can be quite tricky for people to um get used to initially but people often do once they get into it and again, we're not saying that to put you off. It is a fan there are fantastic elements to the training and the role, but just to highlight the ugly bit straight on, off the bat as well. And yeah, I can't stress enough there is, of course, the pressures of targets, needing to see a certain amount of people a week, needing to achieve a certain level of what, well, you know, quote, recovery, uh, which is determined by outcome measures um, each month. And every service does it a little differently. Um, so the other thing to is remember as well is that if you're trained as a PWP and you don't enjoy your experience, it might be the service. I say that because my service very much don't look they're very much like Vicky's in that we can offer extensions. We don't seem to look at recovery too much. For us, it is more um, the meaningful work we do. But we're quite lucky in that we have a clinical lead who is very patient centred. In that. Yeah. Anything else to add on that, Vicky? And it depends on the service at the end of the day. Um, my recommendation, um, if, when you do apply, I mean, that's coming into questions to ask. You might want to, so one thing to know, 
PWP turnover is really high. And that's because there's so many opportunities. If you get on it, for example, myself and so did Jason, we trained at our same service. We then uh, qualified and st stuck with the same service. And then we went on to senior and now Jason is on the high intensity with his service. So there is always CPD progression available yeah. within a service and or a group service. And not only that progression within IAC, but also many PWPs do get on the decline mm. from training. I've seen I've trained with people who applied while training at UCL and literally come October, they were starting the decline. And so I think one of the benefits of the training is, and this is what I've highlighted before, when compared to an assistant psych role and a PWP role, these are different jobs and they're not comparable. However, what I always say to people is, if you are interested in learning a predetermined set of skills and guaranteed set, um, then the PWP training is great for that because as, we, as many people here might know, every assistant psych job is different and there aren't guaranteed skills or things you're going to do. Some are really fantastic. Some that I've experienced are essentially having you be a glorified admin worker. Um, with the PWP train, you are getting a set of skills in assessing, formulating, risk assessing, supervision, evidence-based therapy, manage, using and interpreting outcome measures, managing a database, uh, probably God knows a lot more. And those are guaranteed with every PWP. So there's the benefit in that. There's also the added benefit of, for many people in this career, you, you often feel like there's only one route and that's the decline. And that's really hard to get on. And that's really scary to kind of be getting older and still on a band three, band four, possibly band five role and seeing perhaps other people and your friends around you in other sectors progressing in their careers, where for me, it felt like I was in a job and earning a lot less than them. Um, as Vicky mentioned, there is that progression, and progression in IAP happens quite quick. You train at band four, you progress onto band five. A year afterwards, you can go for a senior role at band six. A year after that, you could do the high intensity, or you can become a step two lead, where that's a band seven. So there is a lot of quick progression within that as well. So those, for me, are some of the benefits of doing the training. And just to, um, and uh, I know we'll do questions at the end, um, but we can't actually share the specific services of which one are more uh, person centered. What I would, the reason I started talking about high turnover for PWPs, and not only because, you know, CPD, but also as Jason was saying, you get on the clinic, the clean or the counseling doctorate or whatever it is you decide to choose or whether you decide to go for an AP role because it suits you more. And that's absolutely fine too. Um, what you might want to ask, and that's always a really good indication of is a service good or not. It's not, judging it by the PWP turnover, because the PWP turnover will always be high. Yeah. The way I can determine, and this is just me, this is what I think, the way I determine how a service is actually a decent service or patient-centered or person-centered is based on the high intensity turnover rate. Because most services will have, good services will have a low turnover for CBP therapists and counselors. But that's just my mm. my observation. No, that makes sense, actually, <laughs> as well. So, yeah, quite clever. Um, yeah, and I think, like anything, it's about gauging it, perhaps asking around, you know, contacting the service beforehand. Um, so, for me, I can only say I applied for Bromley, and that was just because of location. And, you know, I was quite lucky with that because Bromley ended up being a service I really do enjoy working with. Um, however, when I applied for the high intensity, well, I applied to 11 place. I applied to like 12 places, got 11 interviews, went for six. And um, well, that's another story. Um, I actually contacted each service and spoke to the lead and I gauged my reaction based on what a lot of what they were saying. And for me, that's what helped determine whether I felt comfortable to interview with them. So I guess if you have the time, just calling the service with any questions you have and just getting a judge of character from there, especially from the clinical lead if possible, because a lot of how the service will be run and structured is going to start from the top as well. 
So that's kind of the ins and outs. And if there are questions, um, do feel free to ask. We might look at more, that more at the end just for time's sake, but do feel free to pop it in the chat at any point. Um, so that's kind of the life and times of being a PWP, the advantages and disadvantages. Now, I guess it's kind of thinking a little bit about um, the interview process, unless there's anything before that, Becky? Did no, I, I think um, we can move on to that. Yeah, so um, of course, for many people, I don't know if applications have started opening or they're due to open. I think UCRs is next month, um, but I don't know with other places. I am more familiar with UCL, and I think Vicky has a more broad range of understanding based on the other services. So, um, of course, there is the interview process, and that is right in the application. That's, of course, the key stage in any job to get in that interview. Um, so we might have... Vicky might disagree with me here, and that's fine. But often the golden rule for me is when applying for the job is to really look at the person's specs and to make sure you are answering every section that is assessed during application, preferably in order of how it's presented. But not only saying, well, this is the common mistake I see when reviewing people's applications, not just saying, I do this, I have this, but actually tell me a little bit about how you have that, how you apply that to the, how you can apply that to the PWP role and training. How does that make you a candidate for the training role? Because what often people do is they'll kind of tell me, oh, I'm an assistant psychologist. I work with older adults and I do this and that. And it's like, but I've already seen that in the job description section of the application. So you're just kind of repeating what I already know. What I actually want to know is the reflective part of that process. What, what have you learned from working with that? What has that offered you? How have you learned these things? And how are you going to apply that to the PWP training? What, how does that help for the training? So that's my first bit of advice. What have you got? What do you think about that, Vicky? Because you might have a different opinion. I completely agree. You need to read the job spec properly, um, not just half arse it. Because if when I do interviews and I've hired a lot of people so far, um, or just went through that interview process a lot of, with different people, the ones that stand out are the ones that are more personalised to you. Mm -hmm. It's great for me to know about your, you know, uni dissertation, what you've done with it. That's excellent. But can, can't that wait till the interview? Um, so, and I've seen it in the qualification section. So why are you writing paragraphs, reams and reams and reams about whatever dissertation you wrote about? Yeah. You can mention it briefly, but I want you, what I always look for is personality if it doesn't come through and I can see that, you know, either you've um, got like a template um, of someone else who was successfully hired for the role and you're just rewriting their words, it's easily readable because when it becomes a good application, if your personal um, statement or whatever you write about is very much about you and your past and how, what you've, you know, it's all about reflective practice. Mm -hmm. You need to be critical of your own competence because that's what the uni course will be about. It's all about, you know, critical reflection, evaluation, critical thinking. And that, if you present that with tweet, you know, putting extra personality in there, then I'm giving you an interview. Yeah. <laughs> like, as long as you meet the qualifications that's required from the job spec, I can give you an example. Um, to this day, my my old senior remembers my application, remembers my interview, and remembers other people's applications and interviews because someone started talking in their interview, for example, about Rick and Morty, their favorite show, and they used that to basically reflect on themselves and how they resonate with Rick or Morty. Clearly, I don't know, I've never watched the show, so <laughs> I wouldn't know. Um, but I did exactly the same. I was talking about my um, skating background, my asthma, you know, talk about that and bring in why you've learned, what did you do to be able to overcome obstacles in your past? Why, you know, everything that is in that, um, job spec or person spec just bring it some flavor to it when you answer it in that essay that's my advice 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that sounds like fantastic advice. And um, I think what immediately comes to me is many people will have a degree. Well, you need a degree of some kind to get onto the PWP training. And the usual typical opener is I have a BSc in psychology, blah, blah, blah. And I did that. But I told them what actually they offered it. So I didn't just say I've got a BSc in psychology. I said I have a BSc in psychology doing this degree taught me to be crit- to taught me to be critical of my analysis, taught me these and so on and so on. Um, also talk about supervision. That's a real key aspect of the role is supervision practice. And you are assessed on that throughout the train or you are at least with UCL. And with that, I, again, I said I utilize supervision, but I said that I utilize supervision to help um, identify obstacles to kind of you know, improve my competencies to highlight my difficulties. And I gave an example of how I use that supervision highlight in a difficulty. And it was kind of, it may, it might seem like, oh, you're highlighting a moment that might made you feel incompetent. But what everyone's going to be incompetent at one point. But what I did with that was show that, yeah, I can recognize when I've hit a wall and I know what I, to do with that and how to overcome it. So it really is about injecting that personality and your experience because that is unique to you and that's something no one else can replicate. When I I don't read applications or interviews anymore, but much what I've seen, what I, much what I saw when I was shortlisting for the trainee role or even qualified, and even sometimes now when people ask me to read their application, it's always the same mistake of I've got I've got X, I've done Y, I can do Z, and it's like so can the other person whose application I've just read as well that's too generic I need more absolutely and I think that's a really key point you have to sell yourself as desirable if you speak multiple languages put it in there Mm -hmm. if you're willing to relocate put it in there if you're willing to go above and beyond to get this role it shows enthusiasm put it in there sell yourself because it's great if you can sell yourself in the interview but great but you need to be able to get the interview first absolutely especially with UCL the way they do it is just super different and I'm sure Jason will briefly touch up on how they do it and then I can give you examples of how everywhere else does it (laughs) how the rest Um, of the world do it properly (laughs) exactly (laughs) Um, nothing against UCL they're a fantastic course Um, but with UCL I'll quickly highlight so UCL is very different you are applying through their own portal and you essentially will read the list of services you can apply and work with. And on your application, your personal statement, you must start the sentence with, my first choice is this service, my second choice is this service. Don't worry if you don't do that, they'll just randomly assign you to a service if you get an interview, but it it does mean you don't get to pick which service you'd like to work for. Now, initially when I applied, I thought, okay, I have two chances, I could either apply I could either interview with Bromley or I could interview with Greenwich. Um, no, only one of them. So if your first choice selects you for an interview, the second choice won't even see your application. If the first choice passes you on, passes you on, they don't want to shortlist you, then the second service will have a look at your application. Now, it's important to note as well as that UCL, unless this has changed, do the initial screening of all applications. They will look at it themselves, then they will pass on possible candidates to the services where the service will then do further shortlisting. So you kind of got to get through a few stages. Now, the most difficult part of UCL is you are limited to an extremely limited word count. So everything we've just said, unfortunately, kind of goes out the window. <laughs> um, what I would really do is kind of like the deep clean application. I don't know if anyone here has tried applying for the deep clean. But in the personal statement, it's not about highlighting what you do. So it's not saying I do this, I do that. It really is more about the latter part of what Vicky was saying, the more personality part, the reflective part. Saving the word count and not saying, for example, I'm an assistant psychologist and I do X, Y, Z, but actually saying as an assistant psychologist, I was tasked with this and this is what I've done and this is what I've learned from it. Because they can see from the job description what you mean by assistant psychologist. So for example, I was a research assistant at one point. I didn't say I was a research assistant in the application. I just said, during my time researching, I worked on a perinatal study with King's College London, looking at, um, and I didn't even say, no, actually I didn't even go into the details. 
during my time as a research assistant is what I put, this is what I've learned, this is what I did, pretty much. So my tips, and I, I mentioned this because I get, I see this question a lot on the, on the Vicky's Facebook group, um, and just generally this thing of, are people following the person specs when trying to apply to UCL, and you can't follow it like that. So my advice is to really make sure you're highlighting your competencies, but try and be as personable as you can to really highlight who you are as an individual. And please use headers. Yeah. <laughs> I, if I look at an application and it's just reams and reams and paragraphs, I will be screaming. <laughs> yeah. You, you can use bullet points even. I use bullet points at the start. I literally just wrote down bullet points of my skills and just expanded on uh, expanded um, each point. And then I went into more contextual stuff that I've done. But I use um, headers for sure. It just makes it so much more attractive to read and you want to read it. Absolutely. Rather than just an essay. Especially because with the other universities, you are you have the option to write like a two page personal application. Um, and so yeah, definitely thinking about you want to think about the reader. They're going to be screening dozens of applications, and uh, with that, if they you know if they get to a point where it's too frustrating to read, well you know who's to say they're not just going to pass on it because these are people. At the end of the day, it's little, again it is a little different with UCL. You don't have the luxury of headers, but it is also only five hundred words, so you are extremely limited anyway. And that's I think that's less than a page. It works out too. We well. get to page everywhere else. Yeah. So, so oh, go on, Vic. Yeah, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say. So, an example. Um, so, I guess for me, what I tend to want to see on the application, um, in terms of the skill set, is I want to see that you know the following: supervision, risk management, formulation, assessment, evidence-based interventions, managing a caseload interpreting and using outcome measures. If you can kind of meet, if you highlight those skills, you will personally get extra points from me as well. And I mention that because we sometimes have jobs where it's clear the person just doesn't know what they're applying to as well. Sorry, Vicky, I'll let you go. No, that's fine. Yes, please make sure. I know a lot of you might have or are currently writing your templates and you're applying for AP roles and PWP roles and, and DCLIN applications or whatever it is, um, mental health worker roles. Make sure whatever you apply to, you change what you're applying to. So uh, the amount of times I read someone's application for the trainee role saying, yeah, I really want to become an assistant psychologist because so and so and so. I'm like, bless you, the application's really good, but you've got the wrong job role. So it already screams red flags that actually, are you, you know, do you pay attention to detail? Are you organized enough? You know, it raises questions. So please make sure that's accurate. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, you know, I guess, you know, I'm thinking, is there anything else about, oh, no, you want to talk about the application process for your unit because it's different. So everywhere else, um, the application process is different. Um, so if you apply to UCL, um, first of all, I will just um, point that out that it's really difficult to get into UCL. I never even got an interview with them when I applied. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, it is what it is. But my friend, for example, did, and it's really stressful. Um, however, the rest of the services in um, Surrey, I, I can talk more about Surrey, Essex in um, UEA, for example, because um, what they have, what they do is you apply to the service and if you get through the screening, so if um, the seniors or and the clinical lead, so multiple people go through it, and then we create a short list and a reserve list. We will then invite you to um, an interview. But in that interview, you will not be separately interviewed by the uni. So Essex are now doing exactly the same as what Jason's doing. So you get three, four services. So you get um, different areas and you pick your top choice. We screen you. If we pass you on, you get the second choice. Um, they screen you and so on. Surrey are still not doing that. Um, so it will be one of those uh, where you have to 
make sure you read um, the job application for sure, um, because that's where it will be highlighted. With Essex, um, you will, with Essex Uni, the, the lecturer will be in that interview. So you will get two um, people from the service and then you will get the uni lecturer um, in the interview as well. So you'll get multiple questions, different areas, but except, um, expect a couple of questions around, you know, research, how you conduct yourself, how you organize your, uh, your work and yourself to be able to manage your caseload, as Jason was saying. Um, Surrey are still doing the, the case where you apply and you apply to the services rather than picking choices of top choice, second choice, third choice, and so on. You will need to remember I would always be mindful that I'm applying to the service where I want to be working at. Because sometimes the services get commissioned for a different uni. Sometimes someone in Essex will get commissioned to go to UEA in Norwich. So it's a drive or it takes time. Now we're working remotely, so it's always helpful. But just be mindful of the fact and maybe that's a question you want to ask, you know, which uni is it with? Because if it requires you a long commute, then actually that takes a long time out of your day. So just be mindful when when working. Um, well, if you do get an interview or if you're about to apply and this, as Jason was saying, you're more than welcome to contact the clinical leads or the senior PWPs if they have any, um, just to ask a couple of more questions. And it shows that you are eager, you are keen, it shows that you're interested, you're doing your research and those are massive brownie points in my eyes anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I know from, sorry, and I guess it depends on the service, I know someone who applied two day adaption service with Surrey and that was a two day event. So they went to the first event, which was kind of a group based thing where they took part in various group activities. And from that, they were a few people were then further shoot this, shortlisted for an individual interview. That was back in 2017. So I don't know if some places are still doing that, but just an FYI that that may be a possibility with some places out of London. As well. I'm not sure if you've heard of that, Vicky. I have. Um, I didn't get in for them. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I know. Um, someone told me that with the Surrey one, it was all group based stuff like role playing, doing kind of group based exercises. And yeah, the whole time you're being observed by people. So with if you are shortlisted for anything like that, you want to make sure that you are coming across, you know, cooperative, friendly, not too cocky you know, um, a nice person because they're, they're essentially judging your character. Mm. Yeah, which isn't all, which doesn't sound nice for me anyway. <laughs> it is very daunting, but if you want to become a therapist or a practitioner, um, these are the traits you need to have, or you have to have some small amount. You can't be, you know, lack empathy and, and be in this role. Um, so even if it's not fully there or you don't know how to, um, you know, improve on that, then it's fine. Um, and just a heads up, the reason I'm telling you that actually I've failed multiple times. I mean, I applied once and I got in, but yes, I applied once to many different unis and lots of them rejected me. So <laughs> just remember um, that it's completely normal to not get in on the first try or to get rejections as well, um, because it will make you stronger and you'll learn. So always ask for feedback if you don't get an interview or if you don't get um, get hired, and, because it's very competitive. And it took me two attempts just to highlight. I think one of the benefits of the PWP training is that there are two intakes a year, so you don't have to wait too long between intakes to apply again. But yeah, it does take repetition it and don't take it as a sign of you know your in, incapabilities of doing the train if you don't get on the first time it took me two times you know it was just that perseverance of learning from each attempt as well okay so anything else on the application before we look at the interview process 
I think, you know, okay. my final words is to sell yourself. I think with the, so with the interview process with UCL, again, I, I'm only familiar with UCL, um, but with UCL, it's a very short interview. It's 30 minutes and you are interviewed by a panel of three. Typically two people from the service you're interviewing for and one person from the university. And I know the format of the questions have changed, but I would say a lot of the questions are more reflective based. And one of the common pitfalls I've seen when people answer questions is they might give the correct answer, but they've done it, they answered it in a sentence and then stopped talking. They didn't show us how they got to that answer. They didn't talk, show, highlight their personality, their character, their history. Um, and so my golden rule is whenever I'm answering a question to really inject a bit of my personality in there. How have I come to that answer? What, what experiences have I had that have led me to that? What doubts am I having about that? What, what am I willing to learn? What am I unsure about? And you know, what have I, what would I take forward? So for example, um, and I can, I can say this because I know this question doesn't get asked anymore, but it was a question of what are the barriers of X, Y group in terms of accessing an IAP service? So you could quite easily say the answers of things like, you know, they might not be able to know how to refer a nine, the complexities, they might, you know, if a lot of it is remote based, they might not have those, the technology or to know how, how to access that. Um, or they might they might have some prejudice against um, mental health and therapy, all those things. That's fine, but actually, I want to know a bit more about how you come to that answer. So for me, it could be, well, having worked with this client group, I know one of the common issues with, for say, for example, older adults, is their um, understanding of mental health and how they see themselves. One of the common things we know is that older adults tend to get missed as having mental health issues as they may tend to report mental health difficulties as more of a physical symptom. And so this often gets missed by GPs or other healthcare professionals as more of a physical ailment rather than mental health. On top of that, there are the issues of accessibility as in, you know, it's self-referral um, or if you're, you know, most GPs don't refer for you in London, they kind of just say, here's a card for IAP, refer yourself. If you're an older adult and you have your doubts and you're uncertain or you just don't have the technology or even if you've got anxiety imagine being having anxiety and you're told here contact this service it's all those things and just kind of using your own experience so i could say when i've worked with older adults these are the things i saw these are the things i know these are the barriers i came across and this is what i imagine may be an issue for them in accessing an iap service yeah anything to add on that vicky I would always, as you were saying, I would always, I would tell you how I would answer that question. Um, I would, for example, depends on what they say. So let's stick with older adults. Um, you can talk about older adults with language barriers, for example. How can we get them into the service? So I would then talk about, as a Hungarian woman, um, I would, I, I am aware that older adults have a very strong stigma and stereotype around mental health, because if you seek a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or any mental health practitioner, you are thought as crazy. Um, it is legit, this is actually true. Um, but having worked with this background before, I am able to um, research, uh, basically what I've looked at in the past, has made me aware of the stereotypes and stigmas and their attitudes that get in the way of accessing therapy. However, in my previous service or my previous role, or even supporting people around me like grandparents and older adults in my life, I was able to open up avenues by doing this, this and that, or educating them of this, this and that through these means. So immediately, I took the answer, I linked it in with my own something about me but I was still answering the question by saying oh yeah this is the issue that's the issue and this is what I've done about it or this is what I'm planning to do about it because you can even say well I have this idea but I wasn't able able to facilitate it in my previous role as an AP for example 
or in that secondary care um, unit, for example. But that this is just an example of how you can personalize a question because we all know you have the knowledge because if you're getting to the interview stage, I am pretty sure you've done your research. Yeah. I don't care about you being able to recite the um, direct quotes from the Papworth book. Honestly, so can I. It's not rocket science. So can my uncle, if I really ask him to study hard. But what I'm really interested in, or, you know, can you put your personal spin on it? Are you desirable? Are you, you know, can you adapt your work? Can you adapt your practice? Can you take feedback from other communities and do something with that information? Are you passionate? And that's where, you know, the answer will come from. That's what makes you desirable. Absolutely. This really reflection is key and you'll find if you get onto the training how important being able to reflect on it is. Every piece of assignment you submit is going to require reflecting. You do your um, assessment simulation, write a reflective account on that. You submit your um, treatment tape, write a reflective account on that. They, so being able to show you can reflect on all these things in interview is a really good start for them because what we don't want to see is someone who's come and appears to know everything. It's a, it's a training role. We want to know that you can learn and there are things to learn for you still. Otherwise, why are you here as well? And so with that, I would also kind of say, don't stress yourself about knowing, needing to know the ins and outs of everything. I'm not expecting you to know what are the, all the symptoms of depression. How do you go treating depression at step two? Uh, it, because it's a training role that's what we're that's what we're trying to offer you is the chance to learn that and what i want to say is that you can learn that and throw it back to them if they ask you about what intervention would you use you can literally say that's what i would do i would be sassy um and just say oh well i thought you know i know just briefly about it but i was hoping the university course will teach me more yeah I mean, sassy answer for a dumb question. And I think it's important. And I, I mean, I'm just a highlight. I've never been asked that question. Yeah, neither. Um, but just as an example of how it was, you know, if that's what people expect, because I often see people trying to read up on everything, trying to go to an interview as if they're a qualified PWP, um, which just isn't necessary because you're there to learn as well. Um, trying to think if there's any other points. I Sorry? I have a point. Um, yeah, go for it. So just to give you an idea of how many applications we get, we, in my service, if we open up an, a trainee post, um, it usually gets closed down within the day. Um, and by the end of the day, we'll get at least 60 applications. So, and that's, you know, we close it early. After around 60, we're like, no, having more would be crazy. Because, and that's why I'm saying you need to stand out from the crowd. You need to make it personalized because if I'm reading and bear in mind, yes, we have some flexibility as seniors, but sometimes we are so busy at the same time, we won't be able to fully, fully, you know, engage in your written work. And, and as awful as that sounds, like I try my best to go through each sentence, but immediately you can tell you can skim through and tell which one is more serious, which one's not, which one knows their stuff, which one doesn't. Um, like if you make that error of I'm applying for the AP role, then I'm, I'm thinking mm -mm. like this yeah. isn't okay. So don't rush it, but make it engaging, make it transparent, easy to read. Think of, you know, who's going to read it. Make sure you don't put jargon in there. It's very simply written. We don't need you to go through your entire thesaurus to you know, whip out your amazing vocabulary. Or, you know, we can tell when you start using synonyms on Word, you know, right click synonyms. We, we can tell. So just keep it simple, straightforward, especially if you're applying for UCL and you have 500 words. Yes, so absolutely. And to really highlight how much these courses do like to see people with different experiences, UCL, I know from having taught there, having trained there, that they love it when people come as a career change. 
and there might be a few of you in here who've worked as other things so I know that I've supervised people who used to be a police officer who used to be a teacher an accountant social all those things. yeah social worker um even just you know an accountant what's an accountant got to do with mental health but they managed to get onto the training and that's just to really highlight that they were able to really take all their experiences and sell themselves capable so anything else then before we open the floor to questions no i think we're i think we've spoken quite a lot yeah. At every <laughs> yeah so that was just kind of a real rundown of the pwb role um Vicky, I don't know if you want to plug your group quickly, put it in the chat just in case, because there's two PWP groups. I'll do it then. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, I, I'm sure everyone's on there, or I hope to think so, but I'm not doing it for the plugs. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in case you're not with um, PWP experiences, yep, um, do join them. Um, I think there was a post not so long ago that I started, and I think a few other people started offering to read people's applications. Mm -hmm. uh, do feel free to take a look at that. I am at full capacity. I've looked at eight applications and I just, you know, I fear that all my advice is going to be the same and you're going to have UCO and that are going to have like 20 people with literally the same application, which kind of defeats the purpose of what we talked about today. Um, so, you know, but I know a few other people at UCO and so on have offered their input. So do contact them if you need to as well. But um, we've got about 10 minutes left, guys. So if anyone wants to you know, raise their hand if they want to unmic and ask a question or pop it into the chat. Now's a really great time. Okay, so I've got a question from Joe. Thanks so much for the information, Jason and Vicky. It's been really helpful. I just wanted to ask how important you feel quantity slash range of experiences are versus what you make of perhaps more limited experience in applications and interviews. I had very limited, I'll, I'll just talk about myself, because um, uh, <laughs> why not? I had very limited experience. I had six, I had my BSc, my MSc, went into that um, psychiatric unit and did six months there before applying and getting on the training course. No volunteering experience, no nothing, um, but I was very eager and keen and I, I hope to believe that I showed that both in my personal statement and m the interview as well. I was just overly excited and I was, it just showed. I'm a very positive person anyway, but I didn't have a lot of experience at all. So, and I know people who have lots and lots of experience and still struggle to get on it. It's all about how you sell yourself, whether the skills you learn are transferable and whether you are willing to learn because I don't want to hire anyone who gives me attitude and says, yeah, I know this. Because then why are you here? Why aren't you already qualified? And, you know, do, writing the CBT formulation or creating models for CBT. If you know it all, why are you training? So it immediately gets, it immediately gets people's backs up. But having um, experience of mental of any kind of mental health or even transferable or volunteering work like with the Samaritans or a nightline or um, any anything like that even unpaid work for me is always you know it, it shows that you're willing and you're keen and I always appreciate that a lot uh, I don't know if that answers your question Jason anything you want to add um so to kind of you know, because I agree with everything you said, and to kind of offer a bit of a contrasting experience point, I had a bit of clinical experience, quite a bit. I was, um, I volunteered at a children's charity as an assistant psychologist, where then I was given a job as an assistant psychologist, and, you know, you always hear how those are like gold dust, um, worked as a HCA across three different wards, and um, I think a few other stuff, I can't remember, it's been that long, but I applied twice and I didn't get an interview because I did not take that application seriously. And I just threw all these different ranges of experience trying to impress them. Actually, the time I did get on was when I actually understood what I did and PWP offered and I tailored my application to highlight my strengths in those areas as well. So to really show that actually you can have a lot of experience, but if you can't present that and if you can't do so in a humble way, you're not going to get anywhere. 
Um, so we got a question on, thanks so much for this, um, has been really great. Regards to that application, you said to follow the person specs in order. Is this always essential? It's not essential. It's not like a written rule or anything. It's probably just, I guess, if you're thinking of Vicky, someone who's got to read through, like, I don't know, 60 applications, I guess it might be easy. I mean, Vicky can confirm. It might be easy for her to be able to look and say, yep, you matched this experience. You might match this if she's quickly glancing before she takes a more detailed look. But Vicky could probably answer that better. Um, you don't have to. Um, I'm quite easygoing, flexible. As long as it's cohesive, it's transparent, easy to read, I'm quite happy with whatever. Don't forget that don't duplicate information. So if you've written about your qualifications in the qualifications list on NHS jobs, don't repeat that in your, in your personal statement. I don't need to know about that because I've read it above. So keep it simple, straightforward and easy to read. Yeah, it's always important to note <laughs> that, you know, these are real people who are reading the applications. Everyone's going to be slightly different in their, what they're looking for. And there's only so much we can do about that. But the, as long as you can keep it cohesive, because no one is going to appreciate reading uh, a complicated application that they can't understand as well. Now, I'm not sure if it's like this for you, Vicky, but I know when we shortlist, we have a system that kind of highlights if that person meets the, the minimum experience. It's, I, yeah, it's like this algorithm. I don't know how it does it, but it kind of helps and shows us. No, we actually do it the very simple way. We use okay. an the old fashioned way. So if you can imagine, we do 60 applications all manually by hand, and we need to determine whether you meet the criteria or not. We don't right. have any algorithms. Okay, so I hope that answered the question. Um, kind of moving on because I'm aware of time. We've got a question on what do we think will be happening going forward with remote working? It's so different service to service. Every service seems to have a different idea. We're not back to remote working yet, and we're not sure when we will be. The go-to plan with Bromley seems to be to ask people to come and work one day a week in the office and work remote for the rest, but that hasn't happened yet, and we don't know when it will happen. Some services, I think, have already started going back to the office a little bit, even part-time. But, yeah, it. I think... So, David, I spoke to David Clark about this, um, and he has said that remote working has been extremely beneficial for IAPT and um, clients in that actually access rates, attendance rates and recovery rates have improved since working remotely. So I think remote working will always remain an aspect across IAPT, just whether it's permanent, I don't know. Mm. And currently, anything? if you're applying this year, it will be all online anyway, the new need that is. I don't think UCL and any other uni are going back. I doubt it as well. So we got don't take our words, ask the services if you do apply yeah. for them. And just as a caution, don't, you know, don't apply somewhere you're not able to travel to because that will just be a risk. You know, it's always yeah, risky. It's online for now. If let's say much third term, you know, you ask are asked to go back to uni face to face, you're going to struggle. So yeah, that's great advice. Yeah. Um, so we've got a question of, I would like to ask, would you appreciate practical examples in the application or is it better to kind of keep them for the interview? Also, do you have any advice how to improve being reflective and critical and how to personalise my application? This is what I struggle more, I think. Vicky, I'll let you start off this one. Give me a chance <laughs> to think. <laughs> I think we kind of touched up on most things here. Um, I, I, if you have space, then sure, give a practical example. But I don't think you have space for that in your personal, spe uh, personal statement. So I would leave that for the interview to answer the first half of the question. Um, any advice to improve being reflective? Basically, find a reflective model. Mm -hmm. um, you can use the oh, Hall, the Gibbs model, the... I can't remember. Oh, my uni years are going home. Cold yeah, gift, that's, Rolf. <laughs> that's the ones. Yeah. So use find a reflective model. Um, I always use the so what, now what, no, yeah. what, so what, now what. I think that's a Rolf et al. one. Um, is, yeah. 2009, whatever the, the research is. So with that, you can literally bullet point, what is that actual, what happened? And you can bring in your experience so what, what did you learn? 
And now what? What will you take forward? What, how will you adapt your day-to-day -day life? What will, you, what will you have reflected on? How will you improve and better yourself? So just find a reflective model. And I think that will be really helpful in a um, person, um, what's it called, personal statement, because it already shows that you're willing to develop and that helps you personalize it as well. So food for thought. That's my, my mind immediate went to a reflective model and I think Rolf being the simplest of them all do what um so what and now what just because it's quite straightforward so just google Rolf ref reflective model and take a look at that if you're not familiar with it um thanks for this really helpful in the person spec it says understanding of how anxiety and depression presents itself in primary care could you elaborate what is meant by this <laughs> so basically brief I would expect you to know brief um, anxiety traits and symptoms how would I notice that a person is anxious not depressed how would I distinguish the difference so for example a depressed person would be uh, very fatigued um, low in energy low motivation poor concentration thoughts of I'm a failure I'm not good enough things like that and then people someone who's very overly anxious would be presenting with um, nervousness, fidgetiness, restlessness, worrying constantly all throughout the day. What if this happens? What if that happens? And I would leech it, and that's day to day. And I would actually normalize in this question and in this person, in this part of the person spec, that most people, if, if you think about depression, in the UK, one in four individuals in their lifetime experiences um, symptoms of depression at least once in their life. So just based on that, I would normalize that most people will experience one or the other, especially in their day-to-day -day life. So that's how I would put it into uh, primary care. When it becomes an issue, when it's taking over their day-to-day -day life, that it's not a one-off, it's a constant issue, that's where it becomes a problem and psychological therapies or medication support or, and so, so on is needed. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just kind of move on. Uh, you've answered the question how I would, so I'm not going to okay, give my cool. two cents. Um, so a lot of the person spoke mentioned about having experiences working in a primary care setting. However, how do you define primary care? I have volunteered at a care home before, but I'm not sure if this will count towards that in the UK. Thanks. So I know, I think we, uh, this came up as something a few days ago, actually, this idea of primary care. And I think immediately I think of um, primary care as kind of the first point of contact in our healthcare system. And they're kind of like the front door of the NHS. So like your GP, IAT, um, could be even things like, you know, community pharmacy. Um, all those things that's kind of so primary care is a very vague term and I probably wouldn't read too much into that even though it says it I didn't have experience in primary care Neither. Um, so I know it says that but maybe just show an understanding of what it is rather than having that experience because what I can say is I didn't have experience of primary care before getting onto the training neither did Vicky neither did a lot of people I know like I said an accountant how would they have had experience in primary care I think it's just um, demonstrating the knowledge yeah. of, for example, signposting knowledge that, yes, if they have medication issue, then you'll know, you know, talk to your pharmacist or your GP. Or if you worked in a care home, then you um, signposted for whatever other service, um, Silverline, for example, who is an over 60s um, support line that they can call 24 hours a day. I would um, pretty much bring it back to signposting. But yeah, don't read too much into that. Yeah, great. Um, just conscious of time, guys. So we're gonna just rush through these last bits of questions. If you have anything specific, do ask You know, someone in the group, myself, always happy to answer. Um, so we've got, I have only one year of experience teaching um, SEN students, two years lecturing and experiences at community college. I'm about to start a support worker job, adult learning disability, and I hope to apply for PWP soon. Would you say having healthcare assistant or support worker work experience may put the application at a to position? And number two, on average, how many years of support worker experience would you say a successful applicants may have? So for number one, 
I wouldn't say one matters more than the other. Again, it's really just about you as the individual, how, how much quality experience could you draw from that and present to me on the application? I, so I would say if you're kind of deciding between the two jobs, pick the one that you prefer in the moment, because I think both will be just as useful. Uh, Becky's nodding along, so I take it she agrees. Absolutely. Um, and then number two, I don't, I don't think there's an average, really. It, again, you know, if we give my example of how I had quite a number of years of experience in different jobs and didn't get shortlisted initially versus Vicky, who did with less experience, I'd say it's quality over quantity more than anything. Is you know, you could have, I could have three support worker experiences versus someone else who only has one. But if I can't highlight all of that and really sell myself next to the other person, I'm not going to get shortlisted. So it's really taking that bit of experience you've got and really just throwing it in their faces as well. Vicky, you got anything to add on that? Um, so we got a question on, thank you, a lot. A lot of our state in the need to be able to drive. I was just curious why this would be necessary and whether this would need to be stated in the application. I can answer that. Go um, for it. Just briefly, um, sometimes um, services have different locations. Um, so to save time, it's really beneficial to be able to drive. If you're commuting, i.e., for example, me, um, I used to live in Surrey and worked in Essex. So every day I'd commute an hour there, an hour back um when we were in the office so actually having you know a driving license where I could work in GP clinics I could go to work and go to other we sometimes have to do home visits um if your service does them um we need to be able to get you there and back as quickly as possible to save time because don't forget IAPT is quite target and driven as well so we can't have you you know wandering around on buses and trains the entire afternoon just because of one client um, I didn't have a driving license at the beginning. Um, I applied and I just told them that I am having my test. I should be um, having my driving license done and completed a month into the training. And they were quite happy with that. And the same applies for, and, and I got the job, even though I didn't, it was essential, but I didn't have it. And especially, I mean, Jason mentioned it earlier, if you need to go to uni for any reason and it's further away, you need to be able to um, uh, drive and make it time, uh, time effective for yourself. Yeah, I would say driver's license I've not seen with UCL and I think that's just the benefits of being in London is that there's commuting is a lot easier. Um, I guess with the driving I've heard of it and I imagine with thinking more like um, out North England, Midlands, you know, further away from London, but I'm not sure, I'm afraid. Um, so, so we got a question from Emma, which is, hi, on one of the person specs, I'm basing my template on the experiences and skills. Points are very repetitive. Example, experience of helping people achieve their goals, ability to help people achieve their goals. Do you think it's okay for me to answer these points together on the application? Yeah, I'd probably not repeat throughout the application if you've already mentioned it. I, I mean, Vicky might have a different view, but I would probably say to be a bit more succinct and combine them if that's the case. Yeah, combine it. I would start with the ability to help and then I would go into the experience where I actually show a working example where I help someone achieve their goals. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So separate it into two paragraphs, but then I would rejig the order. Okay, so guys, are there any other last questions, anything we haven't covered? Before, we, I know we've looked over the hour, but if there's any last questions. Not sure, um, so that's fantastic. Thank you, thank you, Jordan. I'll just give it a minute just in case someone's typing. I don't think there are any questions, um, but if you do have any questions, feel free to use um, the. Oh, oh. Sorry, quickly. No, there are no role plays. Just a quick note on role plays. They're, they're looking at your interpersonal skills. Just to kind of highlight that. <laughs> but UCL doesn't have role plays. Sorry, go on, Vicky. Um, Essex don't have role plays either. I know Surrey do. There you go. 
Um, but I don't know about the rest of them, um, to be honest. Right. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much for coming, guys. Um, oh, shall I read the CBT guide? Um, which one's that? Sorry, there's quite a lot of guides. Do you, do you know? Do you, do you mean like the reach out guide, the CBT basics and beyond? I think the CBT basics and beyond is more for step three, high yeah. intensity. Oh, it's reach out. Really yeah. Re away from that one. I always recommend to read out the reader reach out because it'll give you an understanding of what a PWP role is an eye at. And in understanding the role more, you can only do a better application, right? So my, that's always my go-to for everyone is read that reach out guide. Okay. So guys, feel free to kind of message the group if you need anything. Thank you so much for coming. Um, good luck with all your applications, everyone. I'm sure you all do great. And I hope this was helpful. And um, feel free to exit just a final note before you do that just try to steer away from people asking you for money to um, read your applications or help you out um, there are some people that will want to take advantage of you use you know support groups um, talk to friends or talk to you know um, services to get as much information as possible but don't let yourself get exploited even if you feel a bit um, if you feel even if you feel really eager to get on the course so just um, you know have some confidence in yourself and if you don't get on that's absolutely okay as well don't let it get you down yeah and good and luck on, and a good luck and on a final note i've just put the link for the youtube page where i've done webinars three webinars on the declin two webinars on the high intensity and then this is the this webinar will be going up on there as well um this is actually going to be my last webinar for the foreseeable future i'm kind of given all the advice I can in the world. At this point, I think it's time for fresh blood to kind of take the reins and give new advice as well. But best of luck, everyone. Good luck. And thank you for thank attending. You.